ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا الى الله باذنه وسراجا منيرا صلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد فان استقى الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار the topic of our discussion today ikhwani is children or the youth around the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam before we look at this topic it's extremely important to note that the messenger alayhi salatu salam he was not just sent to the quraish he was not just sent to the arabs he was not just sent for the people living at that time 1400 years ago and his message was limited by time or by place allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions wa ma arsalnaka we have not sent you illa kafatan lin nasi bashiran wa nadhira we have not sent you except to all of mankind we have not sent you except to all of mankind a bringer of good tidings and a warner and we sometimes fall into this trap of oh i have to follow the sunnah or oh, what does the sunnah say and it almost becomes burdensome upon us and it almost becomes for some of us like it's a punishment following the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam almost becomes like a punishment in fact he was not sent as a punishment rather he was sent as a mercy allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin we did not send you except as a mercy to all of the worlds so the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam number 1 his message is universal number 2 his message is not a message of difficulty or a message of hardship rather he was sent as a mercy not just for the people also for the jinn even for the animals the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sent as a mercy to all of the worlds okay and it's very very important to note that laqad kana lakum fi rasulillahi uswatun hasana that indeed there has been for you in the messenger of allah the best of examples and so it's important brothers and sisters that when we are facing any issue or when we have any question we have to understand that we need to look at the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in fact those companions they said that when the messenger alayhi salam delivered the message there was not even a bird in this in the sky which flaps its wings except that the messenger alayhi salam gave us knowledge about it This doesn't mean he had knowledge of the unseen rather what they are saying he gave us the tools to deal with every single issue and as he said qad taraktukum ala al baydai laylaha kanahariha the messenger alayhi salam said i have left you upon a clear plain its night is like its day i e there is no darkness in this path on which i have left you it's clear okay la yazihu anha ba'di illa halik nobody deviates from it after me except that he will be destroyed and in praising the character of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah jalla wa ala says wa innaka la ala khuluqin azim that indeed you are upon an exalted character what was his character aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha was asked about the character of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam she said his character was the quran his character was the quran 
i.e. all of the morals, all of the lessons, all of the values, all of the commandments and obligations and prohibitions that Allah mentions in the Quran, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a living physical embodiment of everything that is contained within the Book of Allah. All of those lofty characteristics, all of those lessons, all of those uh, things that we should stay away from. The Messenger alayhi salam, he was a physical embodiment of what is mentioned within the Quran. Specifically now, going to this topic, which is youth or the children around the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. If we look at the youth today, then they are in a state of crisis. Our youth, the Muslim youth, and also the non-Muslim youth, but let's focus on the Muslim youth. They are in a state of crisis because they don't know their own identity. Are they British or are they Muslim first? What happens when there's a clash? When Islam and the so-called Western values, they clash. What do I do now? Many of us, our parents, they came over from the Asian subcontinent or the Arab subcontinent. There's a clash of cultures. So we've got the Arab or the Asian culture clashes with the British culture. And then we put Islam into the mix as well. And they have this identity crisis. This is one of the problems that's facing our youth. Another one of the problems facing our youth is the fact that the media and the wider social media they are attacking Al-Islam. So they are attacking or trying to pick faults or misrepresent or misinterpret the Book of Allah. They are trying to slander the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Until perhaps an individual, the youth, he doesn't even feel happy to be a Muslim. He feels, uh, he feels almost ashamed of his Islam. Then another problem, the fact that many of our parents and many of our forefathers, they were not upon the Islam that the Messenger and his companions were upon. So we have an Islam that is mixed with Hinduism, that is mixed with Sikhism, that is mixed with Greek philosophy. And so they don't know what Islam is. They don't know about the true religion. Then we have another problem. They feel that our parents and our elders, the uh, imma, the imams in the masajid, they don't understand us. They don't know the problems that we are going through in our lives. They don't know the issues of bullying. They don't know the fitna of women and girlfriends. And they don't know the fitna of uh, drugs and alcohol going out. They don't know this fitna. So they turn away from the book of Allah. They turn away from the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. From the other side concerning our youth. Many of us, we are first time parents or we are parents of teenagers and we haven't looked at the youth around the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam so we don't know how to bring up our own children. We don't know how to deal with the issues that they are facing. We don't know how to deal with their problems. We don't know how to communicate with them. We don't know how to approach them. As a result of this, brothers and sisters, the gap is becoming wider and wider. We are moving away from our children. Our children are moving away from us and they are moving away from the religion of Islam as well. What we're going to do today, bi'idhnillahi tabarak wa ta'ala, is I'm just going to mention a few ahadith. So I'm going to bring a few narrations to you and then we're going to try and extract some points of benefit insha'Allah. It's very, very important as we have mentioned that we always turn back to the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger alayhi salatu salam. The messenger alayhi salam as is reported by Imam Malik, by Imam Hakim and Bayhaqi, he said, I have left amongst you two things. And you will never go astray as long as you hold on to these two things. The book of Allah and my sunnah. Okay? Because this is another fitna facing the youth. Those Qur'aniyun who say we don't need the sunnah. We just take the Qur'an. We are people of the Qur'an. We don't need the ahadith. So the youth is even more confused now. 
Where does he turn to guidance? For guidance, can he turn to the book of Allah and the sunnah? Or should he just turn to the sunnah and turn to these misguided callers to the hellfire? So the messenger alayhi salam, he said, two affairs I'm leaving behind. The book of Allah and my sunnah. And remember, ya ikhwan, that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said as reported by Imam al-Tabari, and Shaykh al-Albani said it's authentic. He said, there is nothing left that will take you closer to paradise or distance you from the fire. So there's nothing left that will bring you closer to Jannah or take you further away from the hellfire except that I have made it clear to you. I have made it clear to you. You're not going to face any problem except that in the Sunnah and in the Book of Allah, you have a clear answer. Why? Because Allah says, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى He doesn't speak of his own desires. He doesn't just speak of his own desires. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى Indeed, it is only a revelation which is sent down to him. صلى الله عليه وسلم The first hadith which I want to take and in following the sunnah of the messenger alayhi salam in following the sunnah of his companions, in following the example of our scholars, we always start with aqeedah. Okay? We always start with aqeedah. Muawiyah radiallahu an, he says, I had some sheep. I had some sheep which I used to keep between two mountains. And I employed a slave girl to look after those sheep. And he said, one day I came and I realized that a wolf had come and had eaten one of my sheep. Just one of my sheep. He said, I am human. So I became angry and I slapped her. I became angry and I slapped this slave girl. I went back and told the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam about this incident. And he put the fear of Allah into my heart. I.e. he rebuked me and he... Uh, told me off and then Muawiyah he says so I said O oh, messenger of Allah what about if I free the slave girl as an atonement to expiate for that sin how about if I free her the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam said bring her to me bring her to me so this slave girl she came and the messenger alayhi salam he asked her Ain Allah where is Allah she said Fissama, Allah is above the heavens and woman ana and who am i and she said you are the messenger of allah so the prophet alayhi salam he said free her for she is a believer some points of benefit ya ikhwan number 1 look at how the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam emphasized on aqeedah look how he emphasized on the creed and the correct creed he could have asked her a million and one questions but the first thing that he asked was about Allah. Where is Allah? This shows us the importance of this question. Okay? So if you come across somebody who says this question is a bid'ah or this is a stupid question or asking this question is not important, we don't need to know where is Allah, then know that these people are callers to misguidance. Okay, because there are people out there today, very famous du'at, who say, look, we don't need to know about where is Allah, we just need to worship. And another one, he says, what a stupid question. But look, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he tested this girl, the first question that he asked her is, where is Allah? Now look, on the flip side, this is a young slave girl. She wakes up early in the morning and she takes the sheep out and she comes back late at night and then she goes to sleep and then she wakes up in the morning and she does it all over again. Yet she knew about her religion. She knew about the creed of Al-Islam. She was busy out in the fields. She wasn't a scholar. She didn't have the ability to sit there and watch talks like me and you or read books. She was out there tending to those sheep, earning a living. Yet, subhanallah, look at how she knew her aqeedah. Brothers, for those of us who have children, look how important it is that we teach them the correct aqeedah. 
Okay? Because if your children, they know everything about Manchester United or Liverpool, or they know everything about a certain sport or a certain movie star or a certain actor, then subhanallah, you are going to be held to account. Because the Messenger السلام, told us, each and every one of you is a shepherd and he is responsible for his flock. You are responsible for your family. You are the shepherd. You are the one who controls your family. You are in power over your family. So you are going to be responsible for your flock. You'll be responsible for your wife. You'll be responsible for your children. So if you're there teaching them about all of this batil, yet you don't teach them about the creed of Al-Islam, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, they are going to blame you. They're going to point at you and complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the flip side for our young brothers, it's so important to learn about your aqeedah. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he said that, look, free her for she is a believer, he said, free her because she is a believer. How did he test her belief? With aqeedah. He tested her iman with aqeedah. He never said to her, okay, pray, and I want to see how you pray. Or he never tested her in any other way. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam tested her with the correct aqeedah. What does she believe about Allah? Is Allah everywhere? Does Allah exist or doesn't exist anywhere? No. The Messenger السلام, tested her with aqeedah. Then when she got that right, he ordered for her to be freed. Brothers and sisters, understand this, especially for those young brothers or those young sisters. There's nothing wrong with being successful in life. However, know that this success in the dunya, the, the dunya materials, this is not what's going to get you into Jannah. Do you want palaces of gold and silver? Do you want to have palaces built one upon the other? Do you want rivers in Jannah? Do you want to live forever in this peace and everlasting bliss? The way that you're going to get there, first and foremost, is with the correct aqeedah, followed by those righteous actions. Because, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ Allah does not forgive the one who commits shirk or associates partners with him. If he dies upon that, Allah Jalla wa ala will never forgive him. And Allah says in another part of the Quran, Indeed, he who commits shirk with Allah, Allah has made Jannah haram for him. And his resting place will be that fire. Brothers, imagine this. You do something for somebody. You do something for somebody. And you look after him. And you, you provide for him. And then he comes at the end of all of that. He forgets his fav your favors upon, you, upon him. And he just leaves you. And he doesn't help you. When you wanted one thing from him, he just turned his back and he betrayed you. You had that right over him. You did so much for him. What about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created us and he sustains us and he provides for us and he sent prophets and messengers to guide us to the straight path and look, he's not asking us for us to pray 50,000 times in a day or 50 times in a day. Allah is just saying, make no partners with me. Worship me from upon the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam and this is why Luqman he said to his son ya bunayya la tushrik billah O oh my son do not commit shirk with Allah inna shirk la dhulmun azim indeed shirk is the greatest of oppression us fathers when was the last time you sat your kids down and said to them don't commit shirk with Allah when was the last time that you sat them down and even spoke about the religion of Allah? When was the last time that you sat them down and spoke to them about Tawheed? Or you spoke to them about the dangers of shirk? When was the last time? If it was weeks ago, forget months or years or never, if it was weeks ago, then you are failing as a father. 
If it was weeks ago, then you have to pull your socks up and teach your children about Islam. Because if you don't teach them, brothers and sisters, then the internet is going to teach them. If you don't teach them, then Facebook is going to teach them. If you don't teach them, then those misguided people who will either turn them into an extremist and they go and blow themselves up or land themselves in prison for the rest of their lives. That's going to teach them. Or the Sufis are going to teach them. So they come home and they say, I'm not going to eat and I'm not going to get a job and I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit in my room and make dhikr of Allah with the light off. This is what's going to happen. Allah mustaan. So if you do not teach them, then those misguided callers are going to teach them. So teach your children about the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next narration which I want to mention is reported by Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he was the cousin of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, one day I was riding behind the messenger of Allah and he said to me, he turned to me and he said, Ya Ghulam, O oh young man, I will teach you some words. O oh young man, I will teach you some words. The first point that we get from this hadith, this was a child, was a young man, between 12 and 13 years of old, between 12 or 13 years old, or between 10 and 15 years old, when he received these words from the messenger alayhi salam. He was riding with the messenger alayhi salam on his riding beast. The messenger alayhi salam never said, well, you're a kid, go away, you know, go and play, go and do something else. The messenger alayhi salam, he turned to him, put him on his camel, and then as they were riding, he taught him some words. He said, be mindful of Allah. Be mindful of Allah and he will take care of you. Who's he telling this to? He's not saying this to a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old. He's saying this to a boy. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah. The Prophet salam, is teaching him these words and he's a young boy. I want you to imagine if you taught these words to a 10 or 15-year-old at our time now. O oh young man, be mindful of Allah. Be mindful of Allah and He will take care of you. Be mindful of Allah and you will find Him by your side. Not literally by your side. This means with His names and His attributes and His assistance, Allah will not leave you on your own. Be mindful of Allah and you will find Him by your side. If you ask, ask of Allah. If you seek assistance, seek help from Allah. Know that if the whole world was to gather together to help you, they wouldn't be able to help you except with what Allah has already written for you. And if the whole world came together to try and harm you, they wouldn't be able to harm you except with what Allah has already written for you. Imagine these words, look how heavy these words are. Look at this advice. 10 and 15 year olds nowadays, we teach them, you know, how to do maths and we teach them how to do simple sums. But look at how the Messenger salam, nurtured these companions. He spent time with them. He didn't just alienate them and put them in one room playing the Xbox and we're in the other room as elders. No, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he took time and he invested it in the youth kept them close, and then taught them about the religion. Taught them about matters of tawakkul. Tawakkul. Be mindful of Allah. Have taqwa of Allah. You will find him by your side. He will look after you. Be mindful of Allah. He will support you. If you make dua, make dua to Allah. Look, in this one hadith, we have destroyed the creed of many of the Sufis. They make dua to others besides Allah. And they say, Allah. These that we call upon, they are our intercessors between us and Allah. Ma na'buduhum illa liyuqarribuna ilallahi zulfa. We don't worship them. We don't make dua to these idols or these graves or Abdul Qadir al Jilani or Peach Sabu the Darbars. We don't make dua to them except that they bring us closer to Allah. 
Ibn Abbas is being taught as a young child, if you make dua, you make dua to Allah. Don't call upon the grave, don't call upon the idol, don't call upon the star or the tree or the stone. Make dua to Allah. And if you seek help, seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You young brothers, understand this. You in your life are going to face many trials, many tests, many tribulations. If you ask one of the elder, if you ask the sheikh, he will tell you. He will tell you and he will give you his experiences and he will explain to you, life isn't easy. Life is not going to be easy. You might be in a position of ease right now. But what about six months time or a year's time? or even longer than that. You're going to face trials, you're going to face tests. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam concerning this, he said, remember Allah in times of prosperity. He will remember you in times of difficulty. Brothers, sisters, if you are having times of prosperity, make shukr to Allah, make dhikr of Allah, Thank Allah. Ask Allah to increase that. Because if you do that in your times of ease, you're going to face times of difficulty. But when you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assist you. 10 or 15 years old, always remember that. The next hadith which I want to mention to you is on the authority of Abu Umama radiallahu anhu. And this is an amazing hadith. And especially for our young unmarried brothers. He states that a young man, he came to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I want you to picture the scene. The sahaba, as was their way, they were around the messenger alayhi salam. And a young man comes and he stands and he says, O oh messenger of Allah, give me permission to commit zina. Give me permission. Imagine a young man, he comes in now. Imagine a youth walking in now and he says, I want to go and fornicate. All of us are going to be shocked and we're going to try and give him advice. But imagine a man saying to the Messenger of Allah, Give me permission, make it halal for me to go and fornicate with a woman, to go and commit zina. The companions, they turned to this young man and they started rebuking him. They started shouting at him and telling him off. Look what the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam did. He signaled to that young man and he said, come close, come close. The first and most important thing to understand about the youth. You as youth, we know as elders or people who are still in our youth, but with children or whatever, we still know as your peers that you are going to face fitna from the opposite sex. You are going to face fitna of women. The sisters are going to face fitna of the males. But look at how the Messenger salam dealt with it. For you people with children, did he rebuke him and say, get out of my majlis? Did he rebuke him and say, fear Allah? You're going to go to the hellfire? No. He said, come close. Understand this. Sometimes when a person is in a sin and you just shout, haram, 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 you're going to turn that person away. You're going to turn him away and he's going to look elsewhere for, for support. The messenger alayhi salam said, come close. He brought him closer to him. So one of the ways of giving nasiha, one of the ways of giving advice is to become close to the person who you want to advise. Don't just advise him like this because he doesn't know that you're sincere. He thinks that you're just rebuking him. So with your children, when you advise them, advise them like a friend. Don't advise them like a boss. Don't advise them like a tyrant. Don't advise them like a king. Bring them close and give them this advice from within. So he brought the man, he brought the youth close to him. When he came close and he sat down by the Messenger salam, the Prophet salam asked him, Would you like this, i.e., would you like this for your mother? 
In other words, would you like for somebody to go and commit this haram action with your mother? The man said, no by Allah, Allah forbid. Then the messenger alayhi salam asked him, would you like this for your daughter? And the man said, no by Allah, a'udhu billah. The Prophet alayhi salam said, and people don't like this for their daughters. Then he said, would you like this, i.e. for somebody to commit zina with your sister? The man said, a'udhu billah. No by Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, and people don't like this for their sisters. He said, would you like this for your aunts? And he said, no by Allah. He said, and people don't like this for their aunts. And then the Messenger ﷺ, he put his hand on the chest of the youth and he made dua for that youth. And then the narrator, he mentions this youth, he never fell into any fitna of this kind. The point being, brothers, did the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mock him? Did he rebuke him? Did he just expel him from the sitting? The answer is no. He brought him close. He showed him love. He spoke to him on a level that he understands. He didn't just say haram. Did the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam in this hadith, did he in a single place say this is haram? The answer is no. But he made the young man understand that this is haram. And he made the young man understand from a way that he would truly appreciate. Your mom, how much do you love your mom? What about if somebody did this with your mom? A'udhu billah. Your sister, who you're so protective over. What about if somebody did this with her? A'udhu billah. What about your own daughter, who you raise 15, 16, 18 years, and then somebody goes and does this with her? A'udhu Billah. Then the youth he understood. So you young brothers, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he understood your fitna. He understood that women are a trial. He said, I'm not leaving behind for my ummah a test or a trial greater than the trial of women. I'm not leaving behind a fitna greater than the fitna of women. And he said, Ya ma'ashar al-shabaab, O oh, you young men, O oh, you collection of young men, whoever from amongst you can marry, let him get married. And whoever doesn't have the ability, then let him fast. Follow the sunnah of the messenger alayhi salatu salam. Now one of you might say, how long can I go on fasting for? The answer is look, make dua to Allah. Have a good intention and seek a halal way out. Seek this marriage, brothers, okay? Because what we're finding now is we are finding people and fornication and zina is open. And it's from one of the major sins of Al-Islam. From one of the major sins. And it's open. But you don't want this for your mom. You don't want this for your sister or your daughter. So don't do it with somebody else's sister. Don't do it with somebody else's daughter. The next hadith which I want to mention is... The hadith of Umar bin Abu Salama radiallahu anhuma. He says, and this is just to show you how the messenger alayhi salam, he even picked up on the small things. He says, I was a boy under the care of the messenger alayhi salam. He used to look after me. And my hand when I used to eat, and this is perhaps even for us elders as well, we can learn a thing or two. He says, when I used to eat, my hand used to wander around the plate, here, there and everywhere. The way that they used to eat in those days, a big plate was presented and it was put in the middle or a big tray and they all used to eat from that. So this boy, he says, my hand used to go from this side to this side, this side, leaning over this one, leaning over that one. And he was being a nuisance at the table. So the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa look at how he gave this advice. He said, mention Allah's name when you eat. I.e. say bismillah. Eat with your right hand and eat from what is in front of you. Mention Allah's name. How many of us, our children, when they eat, they're seven, eight, nine, ten years old, able to understand, able to learn, we haven't even taught them to say Bismillah when they eat. How many of our kids, when we f see them, they eat with their left hands? If your child is a year old, it's a different issue. Two years old, it's a different issue. But when they're three, four, five, and they have the ability to understand, and you're not even teaching them to eat with their right hand, and they're eating with the same hand, that the shaitan eats with. 
You're not following the sunnah of Muhammad alayhi salam, you're following the sunnah of shaitan. They don't say bismillah. And when they eat, they're a nuisance. Elbows on the table, leaning over you, leaning over that one. And it's not from the mannerisms. The messenger alayhi salam said to this young man, mention the name of Allah, eat with your right hand and eat from what is in front of you. The point. From usul al-hadith, from the usul from the science of hadith we don't take hadith from children okay so when this hadith was taken from this companion he would have been an adult the messenger alayhi salam taught him once and he told him once and he remembered it for the rest of his life he remembered that advice of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam for the rest of his life think about this ya ikhwan for the rest of his life, he remembered what the Messenger salam, had said. So you fathers, you mothers, understand that your children, when you teach them and you advise them and you rebuke them, they remember this. Children remember this for the rest of their lives. And it also shows for the youth as well. You know, there are etiquettes in Al-Islam. So don't be like those rap stars, they walk with their jeans, you know, hanging down by their, by their ankles and you can see their underwear and you see the way they speak and they swear every other word. He is saying this, this, this and this, cursing. Every other thing that he does is haram. There are etiquettes. Etiquettes for walking, etiquettes for talking, etiquettes for sleeping, etiquettes for eating. There are etiquettes for everything in Al-Islam. Salman al-Farisi, a Jew, he came to him and he tried to mock the messenger alayhi salam. said, you messenger, he teaches you everything, even how to go to the toilet. And he said, yes, he taught us not to face the qibla. And then he taught us other things. So look, even how to go to the toilet, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he didn't leave a single thing. The next hadith is very, very short and it's for the elders who have children. The Prophet ﷺ said, he is not from amongst us. He's not one of us who doesn't have mercy on our youngsters and show respect to our elders. He's not from amongst us. This doesn't mean he's a kafir. This is not takfir. But the Prophet ﷺ is saying, he's not upon the sunnah. He's not upon the correct way in this one particular instance. He who does not have mercy on our youngsters. He who does not have mercy on our youngsters and respect our elders. I have seen, I have seen people who with the youth, it's like that child of his is his slave. The way he speaks to him and the way he shouts at him, the way he terrifies this young child. It's like, you know, that child almost feels, subhanAllah, I'm standing in front of a lion here about to get eaten alive. This is going to alienate your kids. And as for you young brothers, the youth, Look how the Messenger salam, took care of you. He's telling us, you're not upon the sunnah if you don't have mercy to the young ones. You're not upon the sunnah if you don't have mercy on our young ones. And our youth, our young brothers, look, the youth around the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Let's look at some of them. Let's look at some of them. Because we're running out of time, but let's look at some of the youth from the companions. Let's look at the companions as people. The first one I want to mention is Ibn Abbas. Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, the cousin of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. When the Prophet alayhi salam died, Ibn Abbas was 13 years old. Okay? He was still what we would classify as a child when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam died. And after the death of the Messenger of Allah, he started a long journey of seeking knowledge. Of seeking knowledge of Al-Islam. And he became a great scholar. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he became a great scholar of Al-Islam. To the point where brothers, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, when there was a big issue or a new issue facing the Muslims, Umar radiallahu an, he would gather the people okay he would gather the people and in that gathering he would have the people who fought at Badr and he would have the senior companions senior companions Umar radiallahu an he would invite Abdullah ibn Abbas into these gatherings 
Okay, so they would discuss the issues of Islam. This issues come up, that issues come up. All men, Umar radiallahu an, he would invite Abdullah ibn Abbas into this sitting, and he would say, "You have acquired deep knowledge that we have not. You have been given deep knowledge that we have not. You young brothers, how much knowledge do you have?" He was 13 years old. Maybe 17, 16, 17, by the time Umar was inviting him into these gatherings. Invite a 16, 17 year old into a gathering today. Talk about football and he is the sheikh. Ask him about how to pray, he is completely clueless. Ask him about what breaks the fast, ask him about how to make wudu, he's clueless. Ask him about Facebook and he knows everything. But when it comes to the deen of Allah, he is completely jahil. So you young brothers, by the age of 16, 17, you should be aiming to seek knowledge of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next person I want to mention is Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an. He was born 10 years before the migration, the hijrah to al Medina, And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated to Medina, Anas ibn Malik, he began to serve the Messenger of Allah, live with him and provide for, you know, help him around the house and do the duties. And he used to serve the Messenger of Allah. And he said, after the death of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I served the Prophet for 10 years. And he never hit me. He never insulted me. He never frowned in my face. For 10 years, he never hit me, he never insulted me, and he never even frowned at me. You live with somebody for three days. You're going to start getting onto each other's nerves. You're going to see things from that person that perhaps you dislike. You're going to see their mistakes. You're going to see certain qualities. Anas was with the Prophet ﷺ for 10 years. He never saw a bad thing from the Messenger of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ never hit him. Forget hitting him, he never even frowned at him. He never insulted him. This was a time when the Quraysh and the Arabs, they used to beat their slaves. Beat them black and blue. You made a mistake, beat them black and blue. But the Prophet ﷺ was not like this. Look at how he had mercy on the youth. The next companion and his story is an amazing story. Mus'ab ibn Umair. Mus'ab ibn Umair, radiallahu an, he was a young man who came from a very wealthy family in Makkah. His family were extremely wealthy. Mus'ab, it said about him that the leather for his sandals used to be imported especially from Yemen, just for his clothes. And his clothes were the finest of clothes. I don't know how you would acquaint it with today because nowadays designer clothes are not that expensive. I want you to imagine clothes, you know, like imagine a pair of jeans costing 2,000 pounds. Mus'ab, he used to wear these type of clothes, okay? And his scent was so fine when he would walk down a street and he had gone. People would know for a long time afterwards that Musab had been down this street because they could still smell his scent. This is how fine the scent that he used to wear it was. He was extremely wealthy. Okay? Extremely, extremely wealthy. You young brothers, imagine you pass your driving test and your dad goes out and buys you uh, a Bugatti Veyron. That type of wealth. Okay? Not the type of wealth we're talking just a little bit wealthy extremely rich and we don't use I was going to use the word filthy rich but that's not correct okay because the companions Allah is pleased with them and we shouldn't even use these words okay extremely rich but subhanallah when he heard about the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he accepted al-islam and his own mother imprisoned him his own mom imprisoned him and then when he, when he exited, he managed to get free, he, he migrated to Abyssinia. When he migrated to Abyssinia some years back, some years later, he came back. And then he migrated to al Medina, okay, with the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now what I want to mention is he migrated to Medina and he fought in the Battle of Badr. And we know 
that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that Allah has looked upon the people of Badr and said, do what you wish for I have forgiven you. Do what you wish for I have forgiven you. This is the rank of the people of Badr. When 309 or 313 Muslims, they fought against a thousand of the mushrikeen. And Allah sent down angels to assist the Muslims. In the battle of Uhud, in the battle of Uhud, he was holding the standard, the flag of the Muslims. Okay, and this was very important. It was like a thing of Izza. As long as the flag of the Muslims is flying and that flag is not captured or the flag is not ruined, then this shows that there's some fight still left. So the battle, it was raging. And as we know, there was an issue where some of the archers, they disobeyed the messenger of Allah. They disobeyed him just once. And Khalid ibn Walid at that time, who was not a Muslim, he came from behind and he flanked the Muslims. So the Muslims, they have the enemy in front and they have the enemy behind them as well. And in this moment, there was a lot of chaos. And some thought that the Messenger salam, had been killed. So at this moment, Musab, he takes the staff. He takes the standard of the Muslims. And he is surrounded by the Mushrikeen. Okay? He takes it in his right hand. And the Mushrikeen, they chop off his right hand. Then he takes it in his left hand and they chop off his left hand. Then he holds it between his arms and he supports it with his legs. He holds it in his, up to his chest and then they finished him off radiallahu ta'ala when he was buried brothers. Let's look at what he had before he accepted Islam. The finest clothes, the finest scent, inheritance of the equivalent of millions, hundreds and millions. But look when he died. The narrator of the hadith, he mentions Mus'ab when he died, he only possessed one cloth. He only possessed one cloth. And it was small. So small in fact, that when we covered his head, his feet would become uncovered. And when we covered his feet, his head would become uncovered. Mus'ab radiallahu an, he left this wealth for the sake of Allah. He understood that wealth, it comes and it goes. He understood that wealth, Allah gives it to the people whom he loves and he gives it to the people who he hates. But as for hidayah, as for Islam, as for coming to tawheed and sunnah, Allah only gives that to the people whom he loves. So he understood that the riches of this dunya, they are not worth sacrificing the akhirah for them. So he sacrificed the riches of this dunya and for that he was granted jannah may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him in reality brothers we're running out of time but we look at these companions and there are many many instances usama ibn zaid radiallahu anhuma usama ibn zaid was 18 years old and he led an army consisting of many of the senior companions just before the Prophet ﷺ died, he made Usama, who was 18 years old, he made him, he said, you are going to lead this army. Because some people, they, were, they had apostates and there were some issues. The Prophet ﷺ was going to send an army out. Usama, 18 years old, who was the leader of the army. After the death of the Messenger of Allah, Abu Bakr an sent this army out. Some of the companions came to him and said, why don't you change Usama? He's too young. He said, how can I change the one who the Messenger of Allah appointed himself? And he was 18 years old. An 18 year old today, he barely knows how to change from first gear into second gear. Usama radiallahu an, he was leading an army, ya ikhwan. Leading an army. Leading an army, subhanallah. An 18-year-old today can't even tidy his own bedroom. He can't lead himself with his own personal hygiene. His mom and dad say, take a shower, you stink. And look at this, subhanallah. Usama ibn Zaid, 18 years old, leading an army. This was the companions. These were the companions. Why? Because the iman, it had taken root in their heart. And they understood, they understood that this religion and this tawheed and this sunnah is more valuable than anything else. Brothers, it's more valuable than your car. 
It's more valuable than your degree. It's more valuable than your mother and your father and all of the people combined. Do not give up this tawheed, do not give up this sunnah for anything. Because the treasures of the heavens and the earth, they belong to Allah. Don't chase the dunya and give up your religion. Don't chase a woman and give up your religion. Don't do that, ya ikhwan. This religion is worth more than all of this combined. And I want to end with two ahadith. This is for the youth. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said, there are seven groups of people whom Allah will give shade under his throne on the day when there is no shade except for his shade. This is Yawm Al-Qiyamah. On the day of judgment, the sun will be just a mile or so over our heads and the people will be running. But Allah says, Yawm Tubaddal Al-Ardu Ghayr Al-Ardi Was Samawat. The day that we will change this earth to another earth and the heavens and the earth, they're not going to be like this, a flat plain. No trees, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. The sun is overhead. There's no shade except for the shade of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not everybody will be granted this shade. There are seven groups of people whom Allah will allow to seek shade under that, on that day when there is no shade except for his shade. Concerning them, one of them, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, a youth who grew up in the worship of Allah. A youth who grew up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your degree on that day, is it going to benefit you? No. Your Ferrari Enzo on that day, will it benefit you? No. Your beautiful, stunning wife on that day, or your girlfriend, is it going to benefit you? No. A youth who grew up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 90 years in this life maximum and Allah knows best that day 50,000 years long that one day the day of judgment forget Jannah or Hellfire which is eternal that day 50,000 years and you want shade on that day grow up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to end he said take advantage of five things before five other things. Take advantage of five before five. The first thing that he said, take advantage of your youth before your old age. Take advantage of your youth before your old age. Ask any old person, what would you give to be in my shoes? What would you give to be 15 years old again? He says, take my money, take my wealth, take everything. You give me your age. You give me your health. You give me your free time. I'll give you anything. Just take, it, take me back to my youth. The Prophet ﷺ said, take advantage of your youth before your old age. Brothers, who are our role models? Questions for us to leave with and to ponder over. Who are our role models? Are they the Sahaba who are in Jannah? Or are they these movie stars who are just following the path to Jahannam? How are we spending our youth? How are you spending your youth? Do you spend five hours every evening on call of duty and your mom has to call you and say, come and have some food and you have to you know, be reminded to breathe because you're so engrossed in your Xbox or your PlayStation? Or are you spending it chasing the women or chasing the wealth Chasing all of these things, chasing the zina, the beauty of this world, because it's going to come to an end. And I end with the question, how much do you love the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Because your love of him is ibadah. And if you love him, you're going to follow his sunnah. So I ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to rectify our youth. I ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to make us good parents following the way of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions and ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to resurrect us with them on Yawm Al-Qiyamah Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik Ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah